There are bad apples in any profession, but it takes years to investigate and discipline dentists who harm patients in California. County supervisors okay a process to implement Laura's Law, which orders treatment for the dangerous mentally ill. And police departments are buying equipment with profits from cars, cash, and weapons seized from suspected drug dealers, some of whom are never even charged. I'm Mark Sauer, and the KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of some of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer. And joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today are reporter Joel Hoffman with UT San Diego. Hi, Joel. Thanks for having me on, Mark. Good to have you here. San Diego City Beat reporter Kelly Davis. Good to see you, Kelly. Hi, Mark. Good to see you. And reporter Leo Castaneda with iNewsSource. Hi, Leo. Good to be here. Good to have you here. Now, as with medical malpractice among doctors, a state board investigates complaints against dentists, including when patients suffer serious injury or even death. But the process can take years, and the dentist typically continues to practice. Joel, I'll start by telling us how many of these uh, cases are there against uh, dental professionals. How big a deal is this? Sure. So starting in July 2009, we asked for five fiscal years' worth of data. So we know that there are at least three dozen, uh, roughly 30. In San Diego in County. In San Diego County. Um, however, th those are only the ones that have been substantiated. So there could well be more. And even in their letter back to us, the dental board said the data uh, is not complete. It's not sufficient. Okay, so there there could be more than three dozen. Now, um, you wrote about one dentist, Ray Michael Smith, who was at the center of two notorious incidents. What happened briefly in those cases? <clears throat> Starting in 1999, that, that was the first incident with a woman named MK. Uh, he had been trained as an oral surgeon, and he believed that that allowed him to do cosmetic surgery. So he was using a laser on the woman's cheek, and it, the nasal cannula that cover, that takes the oxygen to the nose caught fire, lit her face on fire, her eyebrows, her mouth, her lips, her tongue, all got scorched. Wow. And the other incident that uh, was, was involved with this dentist? That was a 15-year-old boy named Stephen Frisch. He had very serious heart problems and probably shouldn't have been um, under sedation for the, for the surgery, at least not under his kind of sedation. They wanted to, states that there should have been independent specialists there uh, in a hospital, had, perhaps? In not a hospital. In setting, yeah. And he didn't go forward in that way. And uh, shortly after the surgery, the boy died of a heart failure. So obviously that's the extreme in these cases that you're looking at and writing about. So uh, Dr. Smith kept practicing while that case went on? Right. He, so he was put on probation in June 2007, and a week later is when the boy died. Uh, and he didn't lose his license until January 2012. So starting in 2000, they, they first had concerns about him. January 2012 is when he lost his license. Wow. That, I mean, that's an extraordinary process. Um, we're going to get to some of that, that time frame here in a moment. You did write about another case that involved multiple accusations of lewd conduct, uh, this time with a uh, La Mesa dentist. What was the summary of that? Sure. That was Eugene Sikorikov, and it was um, the first incident was with a patient who had stayed behind after her appointment. All the staff had left, and he said he was going to show her yoga exercises mm -hmm. and under the guise of doing so he began to grope her, began to touch her uh, her breasts and her crotch and he um, uh, she eventually tried to leave and he told her not to and, and kept her there mm -hmm. and eventually she was able to get away and she called the police and, and he pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor and because of that he doesn't show up on a sex offender registry uh, the state allowed him to keep practicing Wow. So um, the, uh, the whole situation here is regarding, they have a goal of how long these cases should take, right? And they investigate them and whatever the uh, process is going to find and the discipline taken. But how close are they to reaching the goal, the state board that investigates these dentists? It takes about twice as long as they would like. So okay. they're looking for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. On average, it's about three years to go from the complaint stage to when an attorney general's um, prosecutor would go through the administrative proceeding. Okay, and we want to get into some of the reasons this takes so long, and, and there's some complicated reasons behind it, right? Sure. Uh, despite the fact that they've added investigators, it's taking longer for a number of reasons. One is a, a resource issue with uh, subject matter experts, experts who can, who uh, um, dentists who can look at their findings and, and certify, yeah, that's, that's what you should have seen in that case, and therefore the discipline is, is um, as you might expect. Mm -hmm. um, it, but also this, the state has historically had uh, problems pulling together these issues because of how complicated the cases are, mm -hmm. particularly the quality of care cases where 
someone has been accused of negligence or of doing something wrong as a dentist and not just outside conduct. Mm -hmm. Is this something that we think about? I mean, we hear a lot about malpractice with doctors. Do you think about it much when you're going to the dentist or, or choosing a dentist? Well, I was wondering, you know, when I'm picking a dentist or a doctor, I, I look for those websites like Rate My Doctor, mm -hmm. Rate My Dentist, or, or look at like Yelp. Um, I'm just wondering if if um, any of, of these dentists that you investigated, if there was any other evidence that they had patients who weren't happy with their care, you know, people complaining about them in other other forms, so at least that might be a deterrent for patients, you know, while the investigation is going on. Yeah, is there a rating system on that? Yelp uh, play a big part here? There are definitely ratings on Yelp for some of these dentists, um, but the, the, the better way to go at it is the state dental board's license verification tool where you can actually see all the accusations, everything that was part of the history. But you're only going to see that if the case has been substantiated. So there could be somebody who's gotten into trouble, but uh, one or more accusations are sitting there, and as you say, the case might be dragging on a long time, right. and that's not going to show up in the database. Uh, not unless it's been substantiated. And no. actually, um, I went to quickly look that up and see how easy it was to find, and maybe I missed it somewhere, but it wasn't very easy to find. Um, you know where you could check to see if someone's under investigation or has been disciplined I and mean, maybe that needs to be not that more accessible huh? yeah. yeah the the way we went at it was we asked for 5 years worth of data and, and we had to plug in the license numbers individually so you know you could search for everyone in San Diego if you wanted to but you wouldn't necessarily know by looking at the list of people if they had been in trouble for something serious right um, even if the it says accusation filed, it might not be as bad as, say, the Ray Michael Smith case. It might be somebody had an outside drug arrest and they got in trouble for that, but that doesn't really have a bearing on their ability as a dentist or a dental assistant. Right. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, they added some more investigators at the state level in recent years. Has that helped or, I mean, have it shortened the time of, of these investigations? So, it, interestingly, despite the fact that they've added they now have 22 investigators, the amount of time it takes to do the cases has continued to go up, and it was an unfortunate uh, backfiring of the strategy and it's because of these there not being enough dental um, experts available to certify that the, what that was found in the case was warranting the discipline that they wanted mm. so yeah so I mean it really is I know what can the state do about this is it something where more funding will help or more training or they say they're trying to recruit more people but one of the big issues is an expert could make more money doing what they do mm -hmm than weighing in on these cases. So mm -hmm. I think they're trying to raise the amount of money that might be available for those. All right. Experts. I did one last question in the seconds we have left here. How many dentists get their license revoked on average each year? Sure. So it, it was about 55 total, I believe, um, for probation. And I think it was 28 revoked. Uh, and I believe 10 were suspended. OK. And again, the database should reflect at least the summary of that, uh, even if it's not so accessible for the individual dentist. Right. OK. All right. Thank you very much. We're going to shift gears now. In 2001, 19-year-old Laura Wilcox was shot to death by a mentally ill man. In 2002, that tragedy led to Laura's Law, a controversial way to order psychiatric treatment for the mentally ill who are deemed to be a threat to themselves or to others. Laura's Law was not implemented by San, San Diego County, but this week, 13 year, years later, it looks like, Kelly, that that might change. So first of all, start by telling us what are the criteria, what would Laura's Law do if it takes effect here? Uh, for, for folks who have a, a history of, of exhibiting signs of serious mental illness, they've, they've been incarcerated, they've been hospitalized, um, you know, they've had a, a 5150 hold placed on them, which is, you know, emergency psychiatric hospitalization. They've been resistant to treatment, um, walked away from treatment. For those folks, uh, a parent or a family member, a law enforcement officer or a mental health professional can, um, can start the process to court order them into, uh, it would be involuntary treatment, but um, you know, it would be based on a court order and it would be outpatient treatment uh, only. So they wouldn't be, you know, there, there's some misconceptions about forced medication or people being um, locked up in a hospital. This would be all outpatient treatment. Okay, and we're gonna get into some more of those details and what the controversy in, involves, but um, you mentioned the outpatient treatment, uh, uh, outpatient treatment, that is. How, how does this plan differ from what we have now, Laura's Law? What, what's the situation uh, that we've had in San Diego County up till now? Well, um, 
while the county was was kind of studying or, or exploring whether to implement Laura's Law, and this, this started back in 2010 when there were some questions about how Laura's Law services could be funded, whether uh, Mental Health Services Act dollars, the you know millionaire's tax that was uh, passed uh, several years ago, whether that can go to, to pay for Laura's Law. And while that was being cleared up, uh, the county started a program, it's called IHOT, in, um, in-home outreach teams. Mm -hmm. So they would go in, these, these teams of people would go in um, at the request of usually family members and try to engage someone in services, get them to enroll in services. And um, what, what the county found was that um, the most recent data, January 2012 through September 2014, um, there were, during that time period, there were 125 people who were deemed eligible for Laura's Law, if Laura's Law were in the county, mm -hmm. they, they met that criteria. Of those 125 people, only 10 actually engaged in services. There's, there's 115 people that they just couldn't reach. Okay. And so that's when the county decided they needed a, a kind of another tool in their, um, their uh, the ways that they uh, treat mentally ill folks. And this is not implemented in very many counties in California, right? Well, it was a matter of funding. It was a matter of funding, and, and uh, Senator Dale Steinberg authored a bill that would allow Mental Health Services Act money to be used. Uh, that took effect in 2014. So right after that, you saw Orange County, um, I think in May, implemented it or, or moved towards implementing it, and then July, it was LA County and San Francisco County. So you've got three major counties um, that have that have uh, either implemented Laura's Law or they're moving towards doing so. All right, in the original county, if I recall. Is, is Nevada County Nevada, is that yeah, where, right? Laura where, where the uh, the Wilcox tragedy took place? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how's it work there? Because they've had some track record with it. Huh? Really well. They've they, it's it's a small county. You know, mm -hmm. anytime people report on Laura's Law, for for a long time it was it was always only tiny Nevada County mm -hmm. has Laura's mm -hmm. Law. And, but um, not an urban county, not a big city correct. like San Diego. Yeah, or Los Angeles. I think it's um, population you know, under two hundred thousand, under a hundred thousand. Okay. But um, but they had a they, their grand jury up there did a did a study of of how it was going and found that for every one dollar they spent on Laura's Law, it was a, it was a two dollar cost savings for law enforcement resources, uh, you know, county mental health resources, so, and and um, they've really been helped as, as a model. They they won an award from um, the California Association of Counties, so. It's, it's worked really well up uh, there. And tell us about the action this week with the county supervisors. Who was there in support of it, and, and what were some of the, uh, the criticisms raised by people who are You saw, uh, so the, the, the supervisors voted uh, four to one to convene kind of a, um, a task force, I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the right word. Uh, a, a group of people that would all have some stake in this public defender, district attorney, law enforcement, to, to start look at looking at the process of implementation. How it would work. How yeah, it would right. work. And um, it was overwhelming majority of, of public speakers were in favor of it. And these were right. largely parents of adult children who have resisted treatment. They, they won't admit they're mentally ill. And there were some just really upsetting stories of, of you know, one mom talking about her, her adult son who was robbed they took his, his, his shoes, his socks, I, I think some of his clothing, his cell phone, and he was found the next day wandering around uh, uh, school grounds just kind of muttering to himself. So, so these are people who are very vulnerable um, to, to you know, being attacked, to ending up in jail, to ending up you know, in the hospital. Yeah, the so, threat to themselves right there primarily. Yeah, so this, this, is, this is a way to, um, to kind of intervene before it gets mm -hmm. to a point of of you know, tragedy. Something yeah, yeah. sad happens. Now, what about the folks who are against and civil libertarians, ACLU, the people who think that uh, this shouldn't happen? Yeah, they, they think that there's just such a, a, a bad history of, of forced treatment in California, and, and they look back at that. I mean, a, a lot of that's been, been outlawed, but um, they could, they, they've put me in touch with, with folks who have been ordered into treatment through a, you know, conservatorship or, or been, you know, confined to a mental hospital. And it, it, it has a detrimental effect. It can turn people off to treatment for the rest of their lives. And so they have some very legitimate concerns, and, and I hope that 
their part of this implementation process so that those concerns can, can be addressed. Now really what we're talking at the, at the base here is, is predicting human behavior, especially in folks who are mentally ill and dealing with some serious issues. Of course they make headlines all the time. We see the, the fellow from here is accused of shooting up the theater in Denver. Any number of, of shootings that have involved mentally uh, disturbed folks and access to guns in our society. It's always a very fine line to talk about liberties and freedoms and trying to predict human behavior when it can really result in tragedy. I mean, it's a tough call for, for officials placed in that position, right? Yeah, it's, Leo? you know, it's hard to see where you draw the line. So would this be kind of like the last line of defense? You know, if you've gone through the IHOT team, mm -hmm. you know, they've tried everything, or would this be something that parents or guardians could request from the outset? Can they go straight to, we need, you know, this Yeah, where would the complaint mostly come from or the, the um, notification? Hard, it's hard to say. That's a really good question. I don't know the answer. And It'd have to be someone who knows yeah. the individual pretty and, close. And right? ultimately, the, the county director of mental health, or behavioral health is his title, he's, he's the one that's going to make the decision determination and and there really is a long list of criteria and and the one that really stands out to me is the question of is this someone who can survive safely in the community mm -hmm. and and I think that's that's a really big consideration and 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 so yeah hopefully the, those safeguards will be there so that these are truly it's not predicting dangerousness these are people who have exhibited um, you know that that something bad could happen to them or, or someone else if they if they don't get treatment. And, we, and we've done stories on frequent flyers, the folks that the police and the authorities contact yeah. over and over and over again. Of course, there's a huge cost factor there, but I would imagine police officers would on the street would know and yeah. say this might be a candidate for Laura's law. For yeah, and, and Kelly Knight, who's um, the head of the homeless outreach for the downtown San Diego Partnership, she spoke at the meeting and said that that, that Laura's law could could absolutely transform homeless services because she's coming in contact with people all the time who just reject help and, and they're very vulnerable on the streets. So right. this could this could be a, a new tool for folks like her to get people that treatment and hopefully housing will be a part of it. Okay, a well. couple seconds left. What, what, what's the resolution of this? When will the task force or the group of staff that's studying this one will um, they, uh, come I back with? They were, um, I think they were given 90 days. 90 it was either days. six okay. days or 90 so days. So in a few months, we'll sh we yeah. should know if they're going to be poised to implement I think around this. April is, yeah, is when they're supposed right. to come back. Well, we'll so. be looking for follow-up stories yeah. on that at that time. All right. For many years, a main feature in the war on drugs has been the federal program allowing cops and prosecutors to seize money, cars, houses, and other asset, assets of suspected drug dealers, even when no charges are ever filed. It's an increasingly controversial practice. Leo, start by giving some background. What uh, actually is this uh, civil asset forfeiture? When did it start? Why is it legal? Yes, yeah, so this program that the federal government started in the mid-80s as kind of a response to the drug war where a lot of states didn't have any rules in the books on how to deal with situations where you know you have a you know that someone's a drug dealer you have a lot of evidence you see the money or you see weapons but you can't necessarily seize them this allowed law enforcement a way to seize that and then um, they get back up to 80 percent of that money from the federal government they're supposed to use that for you know tools uh, you know, overtime hours, wiretaps, things like that to come help them continue that fight against drug dealers. Sounds like a sweet deal for law yeah. enforcement here, but some of these folks, you really don't even have to bring charges or get a conviction. It's just, oh, there's a couple of things that make us think that this guy is dealing drugs and this, this cash or this boat or this asset has gotten through ill-gotten gains, and we're going to just take it. Yeah, and that's what, you know, the criticism has been, especially if you don't know, you know, this, did this car actually come from drug money or is it, you know, someone else's car? It could be like a family member's car that you're driving around. So it's really open to um, potential abuse, you know. Um, it's an easy way for police departments to get money outside of the budget process. So all these kind of tools or hours that they want that they're not necessarily getting money from the city for. They know that if they go out and arrest people and seize these assets, that's, you know, cash in their pocket. Now, you, you told the story uh, in your uh, package about a uh, driver in Vista stopped by sheriff's mm -hmm. deputies. He had $9,000 in the car, and they really made a case against the cash itself, right, not the individual? Yeah, that so one. that's where it gets funny because you know, they, in that case, there's obvious evidence that this guy was probably involved with the drug trade. You know, he had uh, prayers to a narco-trafficking saint, but they couldn't really charge him with anything. So they take the money, and then they charge the money, and they sue it, and they try to say, hey, this money is from a drug deal and we're going to sue you and that person has to then go in and try to justify that the money's innocent 
which is much more difficult. And, you know, if you're charged with a crime... Well, money a... is the root of all evil, so yeah. right? <laughs> in this case, I hope that money is sitting in a jail cell for a long time. Yeah, uh, it's going to rot in jail. Yeah, so now there's been a change lately, though. Attorney General, outgoing Attorney General Eric Holder mm -hmm. has, has changed this federal aspect of this forfeit. See, give us the details on that. What's, what's the, uh, yeah, the new so, wrinkle there? So Holder is eliminating kind of that civil asset forfeiture part of this much larger federal program. That doesn't mean that cops can't continue doing a lot of these seizures. It just means that if they want to keep doing them, they have to do them under state law. California's laws in some aspects are a little bit stricter. Um, not all the money goes back to the police department. Some of it gets diverted to you know, the state budget, things like that. So it might make it a little bit harder for cops to can continue doing this stuff, but it's not going to make it impossible. All right. And, and what are some of the things they have to do? It really has to be a little more than walks like a duck, uh, talks like a duck, right? I mean, they have to have some specific criteria before they can seize these things, right? Right. So in order to seize, they need, uh, especially for civil assets, they usually use either a warrant, you know, um, that's obviously the easiest way, or if there's a lot of evidence at that time, you know, the car smells like drugs, there's, you know, hollowed out parts of the car. Um, those are all easy ways to do it. Um, specific indications. This yeah, exactly. Be. Specific indications that really point to kind of drug trade. All right. We do have a clip here of an officer. He's in the Oceanside Police Department defending asset seizures, a le legitimate uh, enforcement tool. So let's hear what he has to say. There's a established pattern of where did they get their money? And it's, it comes down to they don't have a job, but they're driving around an Escalade and you know, they have all this jewelry on, but there's no legitimate funding source there. I mean, you, 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 this person tells me they're flipping burgers at McDonald's or something, and then there's something that's just not adding up overall. So it's not, we don't just run around and seize people's stuff. All right, now, how much money has been generated in San Diego County uh, to police officers uh, through this program? Yeah, so this program overall has brought in about $30 million since 2007 for San Diego Police Department. So it's obviously, you know, a lot of cash for them to spread around, a lot of overtime. They bought Bearcats, you know, mobile command vans, a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, throw bots for SWAT situations, things like that. Okay, so big, big bucks. Mm -hmm. All right, we're all citizens. We drive around. We move about <laughs> through the community here. We heard that officer talk about uh, what it takes here. Well, maybe, Kelly, you look uh, cross-eyed at this guy. you got a taillight out. He pulls you over, maybe gets the wrong impression because of X, Y, or Z that he sees in your car. Um, I don't know. It's kind of a scary thing when they don't have to really have a warrant and charge you with a crime to seize this stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, the, the guy that you wrote about the $9,000, I mean, the there are a lot of signs there. I think, yeah, all the, 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 the narco saints and the money was wrapped in a, like, skull and crossbones. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, hopefully, I mean, there there's an overwhelming amount of evidence. Um, and not that, just an officer's hunch. With, yeah, exactly. But this does, I mean, this does give a heck of a lot of power. Police officers on the street have a lot of power in their society. But usually you have to charge somebody to really uh, impact their lives like this. It, it seems like overreach, and it's always seemed like overreach, and it's one of those things where if they'll do it unless you tell them not to do it. Mm -hmm. So fortunately, there are more restrictions on it now, which will help protect people's civil liberties and hopefully prevent racial profiling and any number of things that might result as you know, as a consequence of this. Yeah, I find it really interesting because it does seem as a society, and we've done some stories on this show, where we're looking at the drug war and some of these things, as you say, that were now considered overreach and, you know, diversion out of state prison. The voters in California took that issue up, of course, uh, and that was successful uh, recently. So maybe this is another issue here because you think of very serious crimes, you know, rape and murder and, and, uh, and physical assaults, uh, uh, crimes against people here, where they really don't have the right to come in and, and seize and, uh, you know, do a lot of these things without proper charges and a proper uh, due process here. But drugs being what they are, not that they can't result in, in tragedies and a lot of money and violence, uh, it still can be, uh, you know, a real situation where it's in its category by itself. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely, I mean, I think it goes back a little bit to the same issue with Laura's Law, where obviously if a cop pulls over someone with, you know, 20 grand and dirty cash, weed, and, you know, and a couple of AK-47s, you obviously want the cops to be able to seize that asset and get it out of the streets. But then you start getting closer to a gray line where you don't really know if that's drug money or if that's, you know, the 
car is being used to transport drugs. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really hard to know where to draw that line. Now you talked to Sheriff Gore, the sheriff of mm -hmm. San Diego County, and uh, he's still solidly behind this, right? What did he tell you about the, yeah. the thought behind this program? He kind of told us the same thing. You know, this isn't something where that is guiding how they choose to, you know, who they stop, what, cow what houses they go search. Um, it's just an extra tool or an extra source of revenue for them to get the tools and, you know, cops are always underfunded, underprepared, underequipped, so, I mean, not underprepared, but underequipped, so this is just another way for them to, you know, level the playing field with these, you know, billion dollar drug trafficking organizations. And we mentioned that the Attorney General has, has ratcheted back this program. What impact does the sheriff say that might have here? Again, he doesn't think it's going to have any impact. For one, he doesn't say this is kind of a key funding source for them. You know, nine, ten million dollars over the last five years is not a huge part of the billion dollar, you know, sheriff's budget. Um, and again, they can continue getting money through the state program. Also, if they participate in federal task force, you know, if they work on an investigation with the DEA, they still get all that money. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I imagine you plan some follow-up stories on this as we go along here. And yeah, definitely. We'll keep looking at, um, as local departments have to shift to following the state laws, how's that going to affect how they carry that, these investigations or these, you know, lawsuits against money and cars and houses. Okay. All right. We'll look forward to that. Well, that does wrap up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guests, Joel Hoffman of UT San Diego, Kelly Davis from San Diego City Beat, and reporter Leo Castaneda of iNews Source. A reminder, all the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on the Roundtable.